Hello, everyone. I'm Alexander Kaminsky. This is the Disability Show presented by Many Worlds Network, where we explore all things disability. Our guest today is journalist and filmmaker Mike Peden, who will share his experiences living in an autistic world, a world that he has channeled into a career by creating awareness through his documentary film, Autism, The Wall That Knows No Limits, and his blog, which has recently recorded its 1,000th visitor. Hello, Mike. Oh, great to be here. Thank you for joining us today. What is fascinating about living in your world of autism? How would you describe it to a person who is stepping into a virtual reality simulation of the environment of your mind? Holy cow. Wow, you just dive right in. Um, <laughs> so virtual reality, how would I describe it? Well, it is kind of a virtual reality simulation. Uh, I get in the sense, if you were to peer into my brain and uh, try to look into what I see, I, you could almost imagine, imagine a heads-up uh, display like you would see on computer games or on uh, other types of uh, video games, particularly first-person shooters and whatnot, and you know, all these uh, statistics on screen or the Zelda games, and that's what I kind of see. And in that mind, I'm always looking at... Uh, possible outcomes, it almost turns into a role-playing game of sorts uh, with my mind. Um, okay. I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure a lot of other people feel this way too, but in my case, I feel like when I'm talking to people and as I'm interacting with them, I make a, many decisions in my head and I try to reach uh, several possible conclusions and so I'm always uh, second-guessing myself in social situations. That's, I don't know if everybody does that, but I just try to find myself uh, sometimes where I, if I wonder if I'm coming off the wrong way or if uh, I'm just overreacting. So <laughs> okay. that's, uh, um, that's, that's how my mind works. <laughs> okay. Uh, you had uh, intimated before that uh, your mind its encompassed in, in logic. Could you yes. uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I, with logic, if you can think of uh, Spock or the old Spock, not with from Star Trek, and the older Spock was more of a logic-based character versus the current Spock uh, portrayed by Zachary Quinto in the latest Star Trek film, where we see more right. of a human side. Although I've started to uh, lean towards direction, as um, I feel that my I'm sort of a bridge between two different communities, two different worlds, and so I. I'm uh, not sure where exactly I fit in the whole – where I fit in in terms of the uh, the divide or anything like that. But log basically, most of my decisions, most of my feelings, my thoughts are based on logic and not necessarily on impulse. So whatever would be the logical decision or the uh, most logical option, that's what okay. I'll often take. And so, uh, For example, uh, like last – Christmas or the day after Christmas, uh, we had to put, we had to euthanize our cat. Her kidneys had failed, and they well actually they had failed a while, a long time before that. They just couldn't bring themselves to do it. And uh, with me being the logical one, I I knew well it's hard to put, it's hard to uh, do that. But at the same time, her she was her digestive system had failed and whatnot, and so if something happened to you know our carpet or something else in the house I fi okay. I knew and that in that would uh carry more consequences uh that they would have to deal with later on and so they finally did and I actually had to go with my dad and at first he was like well why are you here with me and then <laughs> my mom had uh sent me with because uh, she knew I would she knew I would uh I would uh I wouldn't turn away where someone else might just because it's some, it's hard to do uh, that I would uh, push them on and tell them, well, it's time. And be because your no, world is covered. Oh, sorry. It's because your world is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, world is governed mostly by logic, and I was going to say, right. you know, bi all biological things have a uh, timeline that ends. But uh, yeah, it, it's it okay. can be some, it can be sometimes uh, frustrating for others because they don't think in those terms but for me i find it to be a lot more relaxing and a lot more flexible because i know i don't have to get myself wrapped up in in the heat of the moment i can uh, step back and try to analyze the situation and then go about it uh, after i've uh, broke down 
after I've break, bro broken down the situation and the issues and the possible options. Okay. Uh, can you talk about autism in the wall that knows no limits and its relation to the metaphorical construct of the fourth wall? Yes, I can. Uh, it's been a couple of years, but the fourth wall is a term it used in theater to describe the – it's an imaginary barrier between the audience and the performers on stage. And what they call breaking the fourth wall – or it's called breaking the fourth wall when the actors start to interact with the audience. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's seen quite a bit, uh, not too often, but you'll see it sometimes in television shows and movies where actors are speaking to the camera, in essence speaking to the TV audience, and then in theatrical performances you'll see the same thing from time to time. Uh, not every performance does this, but uh, – how autism plays into that is that autism in itself for many folks would be a fourth wall because uh, of the problems it creates with social awareness and communication. Okay. And pe folks who are on the autism spectrum, they tend not to interact as much or they may be more withdrawn into themselves. They may not express emotion for things that most other people would express emotion for. It's not necessarily bad. It's just how they act. They're not, you know, they don't engage as much. And so a lot of people, I have a feeling if they were to uh, compare the fourth wall, autism might be a good uh, descriptor for that. Okay. Um, a, a lot of times autism uh, is associated with a stereotypical kind of autistic savant. Um, could you explain a little bit about what the reality of perhaps like what your existence is with autism and uh, how that maybe defies the idea of the savant or it, it doesn't play into the Hollywood interpretation of the savant? Well, it's interesting you bring that up because the Hollywood interpretation uh, or the more, one people most often associate with it is Rain Man, and that was released uh, 21 years ago. And, of course, back th for a few years after that, uh, there was – a all my evidence is anecdotal. I don't have any uh, hard evidence to bring to you at this point, but a lot of uh, people told me that that's when people started associating autism with the savant skills. And then in reality, about articles I've read, only about 10% of people diagnosed on the autism spectrum have savant-like skills. Okay. And I watched a special a few years ago from the Discovery Channel that noted when – people who had savant-like skills started to increase their social skills. Uh, some of their savant skills started to uh, fade, and I think that was right. in more with their brain sort of compensating, uh, in more of a brain compensation in terms of to uh, make up for or to account for the increased activity and social awareness. Some of the other activities would go away. But what I think maybe have led to uh, – a stereotype of savant-like skills. Well, Rain Man obviously played a role in that, but for some folks on the autism spectrum, and the re when people talk about how skilled they are at certain t subjects, uh, they'll get so focused on it that they won't stop until they feel like they've mastered the subject, and I definitely would categorize myself um, in that area. They'll, they will spend as much time as they possibly can or whatever, studying, learning, watching, doing whatever they can to, until they feel like they have uh, mastered a subject up and down. In my case, it's been graphics design. It's been storytelling, journalism, uh, sports. I can give you – I could call uh, many sports for you. And I, as one of my uh, friends put it, I can almost – on some things I could give you the history of everything just because I take information okay. and I, I take information and I absorb it. In fact, you would not want to play me on Wheel of Fortune. I, I found myself to be a very dangerously good player right. just because I've spent so long watching and reading books. And I had the alphabet memorized before I was two years old, okay. I, uh, which not a lot of people are supposed to do. And so I was reading books by that time. And of course I'm watching Wheel of Fortune and, all this other stuff. So <laughs> you oh, could say I know. I, oh, I'm sorry. Do you know what part of the brain uh, allows for that uh, extreme absorption of information that's coming? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. In part because okay. uh, they haven't dis they haven't really determined what 
parts of the brain autism affects. They've been able to figure out what it affects, but not where in the brain. And there's still not a lot of research on the subject. And but I can tell you that for some of these, for the for people with autism now or before who possess these savant-like skills, it's likely a, a result of spending hours, weeks, months on certain subjects. Okay. My other question, like what entrepreneurial strength do you think you've derived from having autism? Oh, entrepreneur, <laughs> that's a new one. Uh, <laughs> you 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 did your homework, I'll give you that. <laughs> Not true. Well, and, it's about my homework, it's my imagination. I have a disability <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, whatever it is, like I said, that's a good question. That's really good. I haven't thought about it that way. And um, I would say autism has given me a very marketable skill in terms of memory recall. I, as like I just said earlier, my friend, my friend put it, I can give you the history of everything, which fits well right. into uh, sports broadcasting. I've taken that up in the last few years, and I'll be um, uh, in about a month. You'll be, uh, you can watch me uh, do play-by-play for high school basketball games on Metro Cable Network. And okay, congratulations. Oh, thank you. And so I think autism definitely helps there because I can memorize players' names and numbers rather quickly. It doesn't take me too long. Uh, not not, not I, to mention the fact that you've channeled having autism into a, a career as well, <laughs> like creating awareness about your own experiences with it. So. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. right, right. Yeah, okay, which well. Like, which is quite awesome, in my opinion. Um, oh, thank I'd also you. like, yeah, no problem. I'd also like to ask, uh, you know, it, because of how prevalent the autism debate is right now, and it's considered an epide- uh, epidemic, and uh, people have theories whether or not because uh, of vaccines. And I had read your blog uh, entry about Jenny McCarthy. Could you speak a little bit about why there's such a there's such a uh, autism is in the mainstream consciousness so intensely right now and uh, how do you feel about the debate, like the idea that defeat autism now and things like this? Well, well, right now autism is in a fight with H1N1, if you ask me. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think, uh, it, uh, and well, and there's a vaccine debate along there that too. But uh, yes, I well, I guess I'll talk about the blog a little bit uh, while we're on this. I started that blog called The Autistic Journalist back in January, and okay. I. I toyed around with a few ideas until I finally settled on uh, blogging about articles and mainstream media, which is what I've been doing for the last few months. And with Jenny McCarthy, I made a post about her. She was featured in a magazine when she uh, released her book, or okay. she had, and she had spoken out against vac. Well, she wasn't against vaccines, but uh, she was quoted as being against too many vaccines, and so. The concern, some concern among parents was because um, for many years, and sometimes it, the trace amounts still get in there, uh, merc- there's a small amount of mercury additives known as thimerosal that were used in vaccinations. And okay. the, because autism, there's no, and this is what I think causes the problem, with autism, there's no CAT scan. You can't get a CAT scan. You can't do a blood test. You can't do an image right. test. There's no x-ray. There's n- no, is, is that is that extremely um, like infuriating at times that you don't have a, a visible indication that there's a difference that that you're experiencing in different worlds? Well, not so much for me, but it it can okay. be a very infuriating experience for parents and for everybody else because right. it, you know without that hard evidence, it's you know, how do you. It, with the and diagnosis being based purely on observation, we we certainly have improved. Uh, the diagnosis right. rate has increased, but a lot of that has been attributed to an increased uh, awareness about it and a better diagnosis rate. But when you don't have something that explicitly says you have autism, much you know, versus like cancer or uh, Down right. syndrome or something, something, yeah, yeah, something where you can physically tell right away that there's a problem. Uh, it can create some questions and some fears and some it can lead to some impulsive reactions and so 
since symptoms of autism usually don't set in until about 18 months to 24 months in a child's lifetime. Okay. Uh, and by then, they usually get vaccinations. I've noticed with the people, with the anti-vaccination movement, or in ter- well, and more specifically folks who believe they've caused autism, they always talk about how their children were fine until they got some vaccination and they got sick. Well, autism symptoms don't set in until a certain amount of time, so by then you're going to have a few vaccines. Okay. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, there's been several major studies de- uh, uh, concluding that there is no connection or no uh, possibility that autism is caused by mercury or any type of vaccination and okay. my other question is well if autism was indeed uh, ca- being caused by vaccinations and whatnot how do you account for all the millions of people in this country and up uh, and worldwide who were vaccinated and did not uh, don't have any symptoms of autism you know what okay how do you account for it because there's even even as the diagnosis rate has gone up, the number of people with autism is uh, a very tiny segment of the population, still less than 1% right now. And so I I just think uh, parents or folk, because there's there's no concrete information to uh, in, tell people that their child is autistic and something like that, that they try to figure, they try to make conclusions. And because of there's an abundance of information and sometimes misinformation with the internet, which wasn't around 20, uh, fi- as it is 10, 15 years ago. It can lead right. to sometimes uh, illogical conclusions. So okay. I think that's what that's what has fueled some of the fire in that uh, controversy. Okay, I had recently seen a movie and uh, it's called The Horse Boy. Uh, it was it was kind of. It was a meditation where a family wanted to go to Mongolia to combine horses with shamanic tradition to try to cure the child of autism. Um, I was a bit skeptical of of the film because uh, it it almost proposes that if you can go see a shaman, that <laughs> it's interesting. But the thing is, is that they showed the boy taking large quantities of medicine uh, before going to Mongolia. And I was wondering if you ever took medicine for autism or if you found other behavioral uh, therapy techniques to be beneficial. Um, I might have read what they have been. Uh, I might have read something about Mongolia. I, I will say I haven't had time to see the horse boy yet. It's been, um, I've been had a pretty busy production schedule as of late, but uh, I've never been on any medication. And the other interesting thing is that to bring this up is the uh, – you're talking about the rise of autism in media and how it's become a much uh, a hot topic over the last few years. Um, diets right. have been a huge. Uh, there's the well, the autism diet people. There's no scientific evidence right now. All of this is anecdotal, but there are parents who uh, believe that you're know, removing gluten, which is found in wheat, uh, casein, so basically wheat and dairy by removing those products from a ch- child's diet, that it improves their uh, cognitive function, and okay. well, I while well, I feel, well, I guess uh, for now I feel well. If it's <laughs> if it's working, you know, then just uh, keep at it. You know, maybe we'll learn right. something. But uh, I never right. took any medications. I've never been on any diets, medicine, or whatnot. I did take, uh, I did go through a few years of uh, speech language therapy sessions while I was in school, just to uh, catch up in some ways on the social front with. The rest of us, well, not necessarily, I shouldn't say catch up because it, it would make it sound like that uh, my thought process is bad. Yeah. My thought process is bad, and I don't think it's bad, but it was more, yeah. I think it's more the, the, I was doing that more so that they could point out, well, obviously, you know, not everyone thinks the way you do, but here's something to keep in mind because not everybody knows about what you, ha- you know, how you think. And so until okay. that happens, here's how you can adapt to, the neurotypical world, which is what um, some people from the autism community have used to describe people who don't have any mental disabilities. Okay. Um, okay, what else would I like? We're running out of time, so I have to be oh, mindful really? of that. No, but we still have some. We have about like a minute. Um, I, I'd like to ask you, how would you, if someone wants to learn about uh, a person with autism and interacting how would you suggest they go about doing that? And, and what, what was it that led you to uh, create a film and to begin a career of advocacy telling your story 
uh, what was that, the thrust? What, why did you feel it was vital to begin to do that? Uh, well, I'll answer that question first, and then I'll tackle the next okay. question after that. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. What led me to that was actually a school assignment. I, was, I took my sophomore year at the U of M. I was in an electronic art course, and we had to create a documentary as our last assignment, and so I chose autism. I worked part-time at the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, so I had uh, access to their equipment and to some of their crew members, and so I thought, you know what? I'm getting sick of having to explain how I think to people that I just right. decided to go forward, and I thought, well, if I make this documentary that you know people will learn something, and then they'll stop asking me uh, all these questions about how I think when that didn't really okay. work out, but... <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did win an award for it, but uh, uh, congratulations. Uh, thanks. I did win. I was the Alliance yeah, so you, Community you Media create, Award. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, like you, yeah. You were about to say, created more questions than it. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. Yeah. But it'll spur quite a bit more questions than. Right. Um, well, and and I decided to turn it into a series uh, in part. Be- um, because I came across more, I talked to some crew members and some others about it, and they led me to some sources that uh, were helpful for the series. And the, the original program was 15 minutes, and then I decided to expand upon it and make turn it into a half an hour version. And then I posted that online, and so that's what uh, uh, got that series uh, going. And that is, I guess, not to be. Uh, chauvinistic or anything like that, but that is one way if you're looking to learn about how people like me think, uh, you you can watch the series and just kind of get a sense that what the series tries to do, and I've taken a break from it, I'll, I'm looking to re, uh, get the series going again next year when I find some new uh, sources to talk to, but that it's not just one person's problem like they make out in sitcoms about typical uh, – with problems being limited to certain demographics. Now, autism is uh, everybody's problem, and it's something we're probably going to be dealing with a lot more. Uh, I read an article last year in the Washington Post suggesting that by uh, 2016, there will be one and a half million autistic adults. So uh, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> you better be ready for us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um, did I, now, the next question you said on what else they can learn or other ways they um, can learn. Yeah, well, I think that it's best because we're running out of time, so I'll I'll try to um, – you could speak a little bit about your upcoming speaking engagement and also your series, The Fifth. Yes, uh, The Fifth is going to be somewhat of a self-reflection. I was interviewed last spring about what I've learned since I started the series, and I was hoping to get it done this summer, but then I just I realized I had few didn't have enough sources to make a half-an-hour program, and then – I got caught up with other uh, uh, productions I'm involved with, and I'll have to tell you more about that on a later episode. But uh, I, decided to take, I decided to take a break from that, and the speaking uh, event that I'm doing is on Friday at the U of M, the, at the Disabled Student Cultural Center office in Kaufman Union, and I'm going to be talking more about the blog and why I've decided to include that as part of my uh, teachings and offerings and insights on autism in addition to the documentary series and uh okay so you're... will you be uh will you be available uh for speaking engagements uh after this after this at the university of minnesota uh also all over the country perhaps is that something that you're looking in, uh, getting into well, if they can pay for my uh, trips or for my <laughs> for travel, I would definitely be willing to go all over the country. Um, if people are looking to hear my story and if they feel like that there's something they want to learn, I'm definitely um, for you know traveling. I don't have a problem going to new places, okay. or I haven't really yeah. left the state too much. So actually, it'd be nice to get out and see the rest of the country. <laughs> yeah, well, I definitely think that you have a, a quite a powerful voice and would be able to. Uh, have some very nice discussions. Um, lastly, you have been uh, embarking on different kinds of projects, not just autism. Is that a way to show that you don't want to be just defined as, as being autistic? You want to show that you can do other things because you don't want to be in that box, you know what I mean? Kind of yeah, like, uh, well, yeah. It's funny you talk about boxes. I, um, I did, I 
produced an, a documentary that was featured at the Mixed Roots Film and Literary Festival last summer on multiracial identity, which was also an extension of a school assignment. Uh, that's how most of my projects get started. But uh, I, with them and, and any kind of social justice topics, I have found several parallels between my life and how and their lives. You sort of, you're talking about boxes just sort of not fitting into a particular box. I've never liked that idea. To me, boxes exactly. should be used for stacking things, not uh, for categorizing people. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I decided to pursue that further because I um, – just like autism, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, there wasn't really a voice for, to discuss those things. And I had a, I lived with a gay roommate for my first two years at the U of M and him and I, you know, connected really well, uh, while we were students there. And it just, and I think in part because we both had something that, you know, people would sometimes chastise you for. So we could kind of connect and we could connect and, uh, understand each other's issues because we knew, we both knew we had something that, uh, made us a little bit different. So that's why exactly. I've, pursued, I've pursued the social justice area. Right now it's limited to autism and uh, race relations, but I'm definitely open to expanding if uh, people uh, want to hear more stories. Fantastic. Um, lastly, I would like to ask – sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I've done that many times when I've been on the mic at games, so <laughs> it's, yeah, this, it happens this, to all. It happens this, to all this, of us. This, well, it'll it'll show my evolution as a as a host. I think. There, um, there you go. So, yeah. Well, just lastly, um, where can you find your video and your blog? Um, just just specifying uh, where people can uh, go and be able to either purchase it or watch it and. Um, yeah, I know it's on YouTube and your blog is on WordPress, so just kind of a shameless promotion part. <laughs> uh, that's fine. I can do that well. Uh, you, you, the, <laughs> the autism documentaries uh, you can find on my channel on YouTube, as you mentioned, uh, youtube.com slash sportsbrain09. That's S-P-O-R-T-S-B-R-A-I-N-0-9. Uh, you can find my blogs on WordPress, as you mentioned, at autisticjournalist.wordpress.com. Again, autisticjournalist.wordpress.com. If you're looking for information on purchasing uh, copies of my documentaries or if you want to uh, hire me for some uh, any other of my video production or uh, storytelling skills, you can find more information there at uh, Buster Media Group. That's B-U-S-T-E-R, and then Media Group. It's all one word. Uh, BusterMediaGroup.blogspot.com, and uh, that's where you'll find info on purchasing uh, DVDs of my programs. Okay, fantastic. Um, I, I appreciate it. We only have two minutes left. Uh, okay. How do you feel about the Big Bang Theory and um, <sighs> the character Sheldon? Well, we almost we almost should make another episode on that. Uh, we should, <laughs> I. I have inter- Sheldon to me he makes the show and not just because I can connect with some of his behavioral qualities and whatnot but him as a character against the other three and how they all are frustrated with his thought process his mind and how his mind works and his behaviors it just it cr- it's a, creates a very comical element and I know the creators were asked about uh, if Sheldon was autistic and they said no or they haven't confirmed it, and I don't think they have because they want to uh, – they don't want to – they're afraid – I think they're afraid or they don't want to interpret it as making fun of autistic people, but you still can learn a lot from it. And to me, Sheldon has uh, unintentionally become an icon for people with on the autism spectrum, particularly at, on the higher end of it. Although okay. you could certainly make uh, parallels, but we'll have to – that I'm, we'll have to save that for another show. <laughs> Okay, so um, we'll call, we'll like, call it the Sheldon Show. <laughs> okay, I uh, I appreciate uh, your being a guest and uh, spending time and being able to talk and I really I I think that you're an uh, amazing disability rights activist and I see you having a very wonderful career ahead of you. So I'm really glad you. that you're able to channel uh, the the perceived societal deficit of having. Uh, you know, autism into something that's beautiful and be able to create a career out of it. So I'm thank glad you. that I was able to. Yeah, no problem. And uh, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, I think, I think that's all. Okay. All right. Well, um, good luck at your speaking engagement. I, I thank you. I hope I can pull it off. Okay. All right. Have a good evening.
Thank you.